All right, thank you very much. All right, nature is vast, but the scales at which humans interact with it is finite. And while this sounds like a puzzle for philosophers, um, it's actually a truth that is important uh, for how we as ecologists observe, quantify, and model nature, because there are specific scales that are fundamentally just easier for us to observe, interact with, and understand. The issue of scale in ecology is not new. Back in 1992, two pivotal papers were published, one by Simon Levin on the problems with pattern and scale in ecology, and the other by Abuzz Holling on cross-scale morphology, geometry, and dynamics of ecosystems. Both papers develop a, a central concept that there is not a single natural scale in ecology, but that many of the phenomena that we are interested in emerge from these interactions of processes that are occurring across spatial, temporal, and organizational levels. So for example, Holling in his paper uh, discusses the different scales of decision-making that a waiting bird in the Everglades might be making um, when it decides on where, uh, where to forage and what to eat. And at one end of the scale is these kind of large scale decisions of uh, where to forage in general, whether or not to even come to the Everglades for foraging or to go someplace else like Louisiana or someplace else, another wetland in the Southeast. On the finer end of the scale, um, you have a hunting bird who is making decisions about what prey item to select in the specific location where it is hunting. But to study ecology across scales, you have to have data across scales. Um, and this has historically not been a strength of our field. Uh, as Levin noted in, in his uh, paper, uh, that, that ecology has long had a data problem um, in this regard. And so he illustrated this by collecting uh, information on ecological studies that were published in the journal Ecology from 1980 to 1986. And these were all from uh, various experiments. And what he collected the information on was the, the sample size that was used in the study and the number of replicates um, that were used in the study. And, and clearly, most of the experiments, most of the data points are below that threshold of about 10 meters squared. And, um, and then the other thing that this graph clearly illustrates is this trade-off that tends to come with ecological studies that we can study things at larger scale, but there's a cost in the number of replicates that we are capable of, of monitoring at the same time. All right, but that was 30, 40, almost 40 years ago now. Um, surely things have improved since then. Um, and so this is a paper uh, that was published recently by Estes et al, which went back and examined the ecological literature um, and they, uh, a study, they pulled out information from empirical studies from 2004 to 2014 across a variety of journals to assess the spatial and temporal grain and extent in modern ecological studies. So unlike Simon Levin's figure, which focused on experiments, where we could make an argument that an experiment because of, of the constraints of manipulation might actually be constrained to be pretty small, uh, Estes et al. focused on observational studies, which don't have that constraint. Um, and they also included uh, other types of, of data collection. So not just exper so not experiments, but things, including things like paleoecology and remote sensing. So really broadening the definition of what an ecological study is from Levin's original uh, assessment. And what he what they found was that, uh, yeah, things actually haven't changed that much. The uh, most of the data, most of the studies that they found were uh, using sample sizes, which they call resolution. Um, so their sampling unit was 10 meters squared or less. They took things a step further though, to really try and uh, further look, look further at the scales of data collection in modern uh, ecological studies. And so they looked at not just the area of a sample plot, like a quadrat, uh, the res which they called the resolution, um, but how long the study was conducted, over what aerial extent, the, the, the sampling units were spread out. So were they clustered at a, in a small area or were they spread out over a kilometer squared? And um, when they plotted this information as heat maps, which is just what you're seeing here, um, there were some interesting insights that emerged in the paper. And the first is that there are these very particular combinations of space and time that we tend to be studying um, that, that uh, humans tend to collect data on. 
And so uh, most of these studies cluster in these hot spots of particular of, of particular space and time. But the, what was really interesting is that there were, uh, for some of these clusters, there were very particular modes of data collection that were behind the various hot spots. And so field data collection, no matter which combination of space and time you want to put together and look for hot spots, field data collection always has its own hot spot, which is very has a very particular space time signature to it. And you can see that with the, where the F is on those on those figures. But what they also were finding was that modern technology was starting to uh, create their own hot spots of particular space and time combinations. Um, and so these technological approaches are allowing us to collect information at combinations of space and time that are different from those of traditional field methods. So both Hulling and Levin posited that things like remote sensing would eventually come into play and supply data for us to be doing truly multi-scale ecology. Um, but their references in their papers are um, kind of a bit like the underpants gnomes from South Park who have this grand plan that they are going to steal underpants and then eventually turn those underpants into profit. But how they're going to go from the underpants to the profit is not something they've quite worked out. And so, this phase two problem of, well, we can deploy technology and from that technology, we will get data. We have the same problem in ecology of not exactly knowing how are we going to do that. Um, and so whether we're using eDNA to do biodiversity surveys or drones to monitor populations, the information that the technology collects, it still needs to be translated into ecological data. And this challenge is especially tricky when we're trying to push into combinations of space and time that we have not traditionally been monitoring because we don't necessarily have a frame of reference for what we should be expecting. And so what Ethan and I are going to talk about today is our experiences in trying to figure out that question mark um, between deploying technology and extracting usable ecological data um, in the case of monitoring breeding colonies of wading birds in the Everglades. Okay, so a little background first. Um, the Everglades is a subtropical marshland. It's dominated by sawgrass, uh, sprinkled with these kind of uh, tree hammocks or tree islands. Um, and it's an ecosystem that's driven by its hydrology. So it has a, a wet season in the summer where the marshlands would historically fill with water. Um, and then a dry season uh, during in the winter and spring where the waters would slowly recede and uh, aquatic life then kind of concentrates in various basins uh, around the, the Everglades. Then we went. Um, this dynamic of wet summers and, that would support fish production and drying winters that make that, that fish production and invertebrates more vulnerable to predation um, made the Everglades a, a, a hot spot for large wading birds like white ibises, wood storks, snowy egrets, roseate spoonbills, and great egrets. And so every winter, large numbers of these spectacular birds amass in the Everglades uh, to forage on the fish that are becoming more and more vulnerable to predation as the water levels recede. And they use that uh, fish production and, uh, and invertebrate production that they're getting access to to support breeding activities. And they form uh, these uh, nesting, they form nesting colonies. And, um, and so like Holling pointed out, these these birds are making these important foraging decisions while they're in their Everglades, but they're also making breeding decisions at multiple scales as they are relating their activities to these water level dynamics at local scales and regional scales um, as they cluster in these breeding colonies located on tree islands that are scattered across the Everglades. All right, well, the problem with monitoring wading birds in the Everglades is that the Everglades ecosystem is immense. Um, and these colony locations are scattered across the expanse. Um, they can also uh, appear and disappear um, from one year to the next. And even within a year, they can fail relatively quickly if the conditions on the ground no longer support the production of offspring. So this means that monitoring the presence 
the size of colonies and the success of these colonies requires monitoring at a variety of spatial and temporal scales in order to really understand what's going on in the system. Since the mid 1980s, the University of Florida Wading Bird Project, which was led into, by Peter Frederick until 2020 when he retired, um, we've been monitoring the wading bird colony sizes and nest success uh, across the 1300 square miles of the three water conservation areas. Um, the goal of the project is to provide critical data uh, to agencies in particular on wading bird breeding success across the Everglades, uh, north of the park, south of Lake Okeechobee, that can then be used for management and restoration assessments. So to monitor at this scale, <laughs> we use planes, trucks, and airboats. Um, and so we uh, find and count colonies uh, using a, a Cessna, which is flown along established transects that are designed to give us 100% coverage of this entire region. Um, we then find and uh, find nests, we find colonies, circle those colonies, take pictures from the air, and take those pictures back to the field station in order to count the number of birds that are, are seen in, um, in the images. Um, on the ground, we monitor nest success in only a subset of, our, of the colonies out there um, because the ground monitoring of nests is slow, it's very laborious, and it's very disruptive. Um, so both of these techniques impose their own unique sets of data limitations on our ability to monitor this system uh, issues that have long been known uh, with small sample sizes, observer biases, uh, uncertainties, and limiting monitoring frequency. Um, and this, re these limitations really limit our ability to understand the different spatial and temporal scales and dynamics of wading birds nesting across this very large and very dynamic ecosystem. So over the past few years, the UF Everglades wading bird team has been exploring what it would take to use aerial imagery from drones to monitor nests in wading bird colonies. So um, as you can see from our team, it's very large and it is, uh, has quite a range of expertises involved. Um, so this, this endeavor has really, uh, really required an interdisciplinary team ranging from field ecologists with decades of experience in, in, with these organisms in the system to software and artificial intelligence experts. And I think you're gonna see why over the course of this talk. So uh, for the drone part of the program, uh, we fly a DJI Inspire over waiting bird colonies in the Everglades. And our, our, for developing this approach, we've been uh, focused on eight specific colonies uh, across that region um, that we fly weekly. And uh, we start the flights in about February uh, and end in late May, early June, when the breeding season, whenever the breeding season uh, wraps up. The DJI Inspire is a quadcopter style drone um, that we've equipped with a high resolution 24 megapixel camera. And when we reach a colony, um, the, the uh, drone launches from an airboat and it flies over the colony on, the, on an automated flight plan um, at about 250 feet. And it takes picture after picture after picture as it flies, uh, flies along these transects. And these pictures are designed to give us 80% overlap between images. So we're really getting a comprehensive uh, 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 picture of the entire colony. These eight specific colonies also uh, have surveyed ground control points put on them. And um, this allows us to georectify our images so that every pixel has geographic coordinates associated with it. And with these ground control points, we have one centimeter level positional accuracy um, with, our, with our images. And that's gonna become important here uh, in a little bit. All right, so the drone takes individual images. We stitch these images together uh, to get a colony level uh, picture of the colony at the time that the, the flight was taken. Um, and if we take one of these colony scale images and zoom in into the area with the red box, we can start to see birds. Those are the white specks in the image. And if we zoom in on the red box again, we can see um, an obvious image of a bird sitting on a nest. 
And the grainy nature of this image is because of the orthorectification. It's not because of the camera itself. All right. So this is where we hit the question mark part of, of, the, of, this, of, of our gnome process here. Um, and that's, we, when we fly these drones, um, they collect images. But those images don't just dump information into a database for us that we can analyze. We have to have, just like with field work, you have to be able to have a way to interpret what is in the image in a way that is then turned into ecological data that someone can use to address an ecological question. And it turns out there are a couple of challenges with turning these weekly drone flights in, of entire waiting bird colonies into data. And so first, while I showed you a nice image of a bird sitting on a nest, um, the truth is much messier than that. And so if we want to say count um, the number of birds by species in a colony or locate uh, nests that we want to understand the, the success of those nests, um, that requires a human being to, we need to find the birds. And uh, that requires a human being to then go through these images, scrolling through, zooming in, zooming out, interpreting what they think they're seeing and counting up every bird in the colony. And then they got to do that um, again and again and again and again. And so finding the birds in this amount of imagery, it, it's, it, it is, well, it's fatiguing. Okay, and that leads me to my second problem, um, human endurance. So hunting through this colony scale imagery week after week after week, trying to find these birds and interpret what you're getting, um, we have literally had field techs tell us they would rather work at McDonald's. It is not fun. And to be frank, like even if we could force them to do this, like anyone who's, who hates their job is going to give you data with quality issues associated with it. And so you don't wanna to have to force them to do it. And so this is actually my cue now to hand uh, the reins of the talk over to Ethan, who will tell you about our attempts to solve these first two problems um, with using drones to conduct ecological monitoring. Don't worry. Yeah, Morgan will be back. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. So we want to be able to automatically find birds like this in imagery like this. But how do we do that? So most of the types of models that a lot of us are familiar with focus on very simple numerical representations of things. And that's true even for a lot of remote sensing models, which typically reduce the complexity of biology to the color of each individual pixel. And then we try to correlate that with something that we know about biologically. But when we're trying to survey organisms in imagery like this, it's more complicated. For example, we know these are birds, not just because they're made up of white pixels. There are other white things in the Everglades. We know they're birds because they've got the right general shape. They have things that look like feathers. They have things that even look like heads. And so that's how we know that this is a bird. And in fact, we even know what species these birds are. These are great egrets. And we know that because of this distinctive feather pattern that we see here. And the fact that this is what a great egret looks like in breeding season. So how do we build models that leverage this kind of visual information that's intuitive to us, but doesn't fit well in our standard sort of approach to computational thinking? And the original solution was to figure out ways to encode the information that we knew as people was important, right? We see these feathers. How do we figure out a way to quantify that? And so, for example, there are ways to represent edges in images using differences between neighboring pixels. And so we can run one of those algorithms. This is a canny edge detection here. And we can then maybe add a feature to our models that is the number of edges and hope that the model can learn that that's something that we see a lot when we see great egrets. Which seems like a great idea, 
and this was the foundation of computer vision for a long time, until we remember that if we're going to do this in natural biological scenarios, we've got 11,000 different species of birds. And so if we want to solve the general problem, we would then have to figure out unique features that are going to work not only to tell us what all of these different birds look like, but then to be able to distinguish them from one another as well. And that sounds like it would be really difficult. And it turns out that it is. Which is why, starting about 10 years ago, a new solution emerged called a convolutional neural network. And these neural networks are designed to learn complex representations of spatial patterns by combining information from spatial neighborhoods, like it's being demonstrated here. And that lets them learn spatially structured features like feathers, heads, feet, and other things that we associate with actual animals. And so in work led by the computer vision expert on our team, Ben Weinstein, who I believe came and talked to all of you a couple years ago, which was a lifetime ago. So if you don't remember, Ben, that's OK. Uh, we've been working on using modern implementations of convolutional neural nets to approach this problem. For, are there any deep learning nerds in the room? OK, for the one deep learning, two deep learning nerds in the room. <laughs> Uh, we're using a, a RetinaNet 50 object detector here. Uh, this is a single shot, one shot object detector system, which means that we're fitting a single neural network that is both identifying where the birds are in the imagery and classifying them to species all in one go. This is primarily beneficial because it's fast. That's good for two reasons. One, we burn less carbon running the hypergator uh, to fit and make predictions from these models. Uh, but two, our long-term plan is to be able to deploy these on aircraft, making bird detections in real time. And so we have to have something that can operate as the plane is flying doing detection on, on birds. This approach is possible to a, to a novel form of loss. So when we're fitting these kinds of models, during the fitting process, the model is measuring how well it's doing at predicting things. That's called loss. Uh, and uh, the RetinaNet approach is to use something called focal loss, which is cool because it overcomes a common challenge for organismal based computer vision, which is highly unbalanced classes. So we have dominant species and rare species, and that's a real challenge for computer vision. Focal loss is designed to overcome that in a way that we can still fit these models relatively quickly. So to do this, we have to start by hand labeling a large number of images. So these models are really cool, but they're also really data hungry. Uh, and so a combination of our poor field team who wants to go work at McDonald's afterwards uh, and professional annotators uh, end up have now labeled over 50,000 individual birds for this system, right? So that's the scale of data collection that we're talking about here. We take those labeled data, and then we fit these models on the new Hypergator A100 GPU cluster. And then we look to see how well the computer does at mimicking a human's ability to find birds in an image. And we measure this using two major metrics in computer vision, precision, which tells us what percentage of things the algorithm identified as a bird, are actually birds, and a recall, which tells us what percentage of those human-labeled birds the algorithm actually finds. So they give us different parts of false positives and false negatives, basically. And given the current state of our work, uh, about 84% of the birds labeled by the algorithm actually match a human label, and the algorithm finds 87% of those human-labeled birds uh, occurring in the landscape. And in general, we feel really good about these numbers, not because they're fairly high in general, but because when we dig in and look and see where they're going wrong, they're not going wrong on these nice, obvious birds over here on the right. The algorithm's getting things wrong when it's part of a bird sticking out from under a branch. And this is an inherently hard problem even for a human uh, to detect. 
And for those paying close attention, there's actually a couple of cases in this labeled image on the right where the human actually missed the bird because humans get tired even when they're working on these small crops, which are way easier than working on a giant colony's worth of data. So those are our usual computer vision metrics, but we don't really care about computer vision metrics if we're trying to do sampling at scale. We care about the kinds of things that we count in the field, which is how many birds are we actually counting? And so here on the x-axis, we've got the number of birds counted in an image by the algorithm. And on the y-axis, the number of birds counted by the human and the one-to-one -one line where they're exactly the same. And so we can see that algorithmically, we can do a really good job of counting birds uh, in general. But how do we do at identifying them to species? This is a harder problem. The answer is we can do quite well in general. So these are these same two metrics as before. Uh, at the top, we have the most dominant classes, the ones that we have the most data for, uh, and we do very well. Like if we say it's a white ibis, it's a white ibis, and we'll find all of the white ibis. And the same thing is pretty much true for great egrets and to a first approximation for the roseate spoonbills. Things get a little worse for the less abundant classes at the bottom. And it's important to solve these problems because we really need to be able to monitor these. And so we need to understand what's going on with them. The snowy egrets are gonna be a hard problem. There aren't very many of them. And if you look at them from above, they look exactly like a white ibis. They're the same size, they're the same color, they're the same shape. This is gonna be really hard. Uh, I'll mention at the end, if we have time, some of the directions we're going to address that problem. Uh, Great blue herons, not as many of them again, but they're also a very dark colored bird. And so they tend to blend into the landscape really well. And so that's why we tend to miss more of them and recall is low. And then wood storks are probably the most interesting thing because as Morgan mentioned, we have to assemble thousands of photographs per drone flight into a single giant image before we work right now. And that generates artifacts and imagery. And it turns out that these artifacts tend to coincide with wood storks, which seems funny, but the wood storks like to nest at the top of the canopy and big height differences from the ground to the top tend to cause orthomosaic uh, issues. And so this is an ongoing problem. Uh, one of the things we're in the process of doing is exploring the ability to actually do all of our machine learning work on the raw imagery and then port those labels back and forth into that orthomosaic representation, which would solve this problem because wood storks are really obvious. Like it's a big bird, it looks really distinct. The computer's problem is not being able to tell them apart, it's being able to deal with that squish. The good news is that even with some of that uncertainty associated with things, we're still really good at counting birds by species. So we've got the same basic graph as before, except now each point, instead of being the total number of birds as an image in an image, is the number of birds of a particular species in that image. The gray dots represent all of the data uh, and the black points uh, highlight that particular species that's present there. And so when we have a lot of variation in abundance, like with white ibis, we can do a really good job across the range uh, but some things are just quite rare, and so they're still clustered around the one-to-one -one line, uh, just tucked down in those rare corners. Okay, so that's the computer vision part of, of the talk, the, the raw convolutional neural network stuff. But we're really interested in trying to apply this in near real time uh, across the Everglades. And so how do we go about doing that? We have a nearly automated pipeline set up right now. Uh, flights get done weekly in the field, which means when you spread eight colonies out over a period, we've got data coming in on a nearly daily basis. It gets synced through the cloud uh, and lands on a local box in the lab. This is the one non-automated portion of the work at the moment, which is constructing the orthomosaics. We would really like to get that fully automated, but there's a couple of steps in there that currently require a human. It then sinks straight over to uh, the hypergator, 
where all the computer vision work that we've talked about so far and all the computer vision work that Morgan's going to talk about again in a minute gets run. Uh, and then things get synced off to, to present results uh, on a website. And so it's going to take one minute here. Hopefully we can make this all work and show you uh, sort of what this looks like on the far end. So this is uh, monitoring for a particular colony uh, here up towards the north end of, of our region. And you can see that we've got bird counts uh, through time and the associated imagery. And so we can track, here's the beginning of the season. Here's February of 2020. The birds haven't really showed up yet. So no one's there. There's a few birds sitting around. We can track this forward as the birds start to arrive and form a nesting colony on this tree island. And then by the beginning of March, they've generally reached peak numbers for this year. These are the birds that are going to be here. I'm going to be nesting at the site. And we can zoom in and look at what the model is doing in terms of its predictions. And so here we can see a couple of roseate spoonbills appropriately labeled. They're pink. They've got a nose that looks like a spoon. This is classic, like the model's going to do good here, right? It's, it's got what it needs. Um, we've got a great blue heron down here. You can see they're darker. They tend to blend into the background more, so they're a little harder, but we've gotten this one, no problem. Uh, and we can scroll up a little bit and uh, see some of these uh, great egrets that we were talking about uh, at the beginning. You can also see we've missed one here. We're not perfect. Actually, the model is seeing this bird. This is a non-max suppression issue for folks who know about this sort of stuff. They're too close to one another. And so there's some challenges technically with how close things can be and whether we call them one or two, uh, we're still playing around with those. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna hand things back to Morgan to, there we go. Talk about how we actually start doing biology and not just numbers. All right. Excellent. All right. So now we can deploy a drone in the, in the field every week. Uh, we can take colony scale imagery that we can then uh, get processed. Uh, by the computer into these weekly counts by species for an entire for an entire colony and some of you right now might be realizing that i kept talking a lot about nests in the first part of the talk monitoring nests nest success and all ethan has talked about is finding birds and birds and nests are not necessarily the same thing now uh we can uh, we, if we assume that every bird that we see in one of these colonies is sitting on a nest, then we can come to a rough approximation of the number of nests that are in this colony. And given the biology of a lot of these birds, it's probably not a bad first approximation, um, but that doesn't get us to nests, if we, especially if we want to do things like uh, follow the nest success of, of, of nests located on edges and centers of, of colonies or between different colonies. We need to be able to know that what we're looking at is an actual nest that is being tended to that can be tracked through time and not just a bird sitting on top of a uh, on a branch and on, on the top of their colony surveying the beauty of the Everglades. All right, and this is where teams that integrate biological knowledge to figure out how to do these kind of translations of information that is coming back on through drones and through imagery into actual data that can then be uh, used for analysis. And so um, we have been developing an approach that we lovingly call bird, bird, bird in order to find, <laughs> in order to find nests. Um, and this approach leverages and integrates biological knowledge with technical know-how um, and our centimeter scale positional accuracy that I mentioned earlier in the talk. And so because these nests do not move through time um, and birds spend a considerable amount of time on the nest tending to eggs and nestlings, 
um, we can use repeated bird detections at a, the same location in order to identify nests, or at least that's the idea. So in this series of images that I'm showing you, it's the exact same location. And what you're seeing in the, with the red circles are bird detections. And so uh, in the blue circle, there's been a bird detection, a bird detection, a bird detection. It doesn't catch it at the end, but there's been three bird detections, bird, bird, bird. And uh, our algorithm would say, we have found a nest at this location. It would also say the same thing for that, the bird off to just outside the ring. Bird, 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 that is also a nest. And it is a separate nest from the one that's inside the ring because of the, the distance. And this is the, the no max suppression that Ethan was just talking about. Uh, when they get too close, we don't know if it's just a bird on a nest that's slightly off or two separate nests. Okay, so this is a great idea. We've been assessing whether or not this is, is actually a great idea in practice as opposed to just uh, conceptually. And we do this by uh, giving a human being a time series of images from a randomly chosen location in a colony and then letting the person scroll through the series of images and assess whether or not they think a nest is, it has been present at that location. And then we can compare what the computer thought was happening at that location to what the human being thought was happening at that location and start to get a feel for how well does this approach, uh, uh, how, well, how good does this approach uh, perform at locating actual nests? All right, not the prettiest graph, but it'll do. So we've examined about 600 different locations across six different colonies uh, in 2020 and 2021 so far. And these colonies span a range of species compositions and sizes. Um, and so this gives us a really broad range of conditions to uh, have uh, assessed these, uh, assess the performance of, of this of bird, bird, bird. So just, uh, uh, we've been looking at Reese call and precision. The colonies are along the, the, the bottom there. And uh, just as a reminder, the precision is the proportion of the computer identified nests that the human, uh, the human said were nests, and then recall the proportion of human identified nests that the computer uh, was able to find. And what we're seeing is that there is generally fairly good performance on both of these measures across this range of colonies. Uh, and on average, which is the overall bar uh, labeled at the bottom, uh, the computer is able to find 97% of the nests that a human being can find in the image. And the, when the computer says something is probably a nest, the, it's correct about 84% of the time. So it's doing pretty well. Uh, if we break this down by year, however, we start to see a little bit of, of deterioration. In particular, there's a big difference in the performance between 2020 and 2021. Recall is equally good between the two years. So um, the, the computer is equally good at finding the, the nest that a human being can find. What it's doing is calling things nests that are not actually nests. And that's that dip in these orange bars in some of these colonies is it thinks some things are nests that the human being has looked at and said, no, there's no nest here. So what we can do is go through and look at the imagery to see what's going wrong. Uh, why are they, why is there this discrepancy in what's going on at the location? And one of the things we discovered um, is that 2021 was very wet and there were a lot of lily pads and uh, we catch lily pads right at the edge in the, in the imagery, right at the edge of the colonies. And something about 2021, not all the lily pads, but some of the lily pads are being picked up as birds. We don't know why. Um, it's different species that it thinks it is. So it's not like it, it thinks, oh, this is a white ibis because it's round when it's, it, it's, we don't know quite what they're keying in on, but it's keying in on something and it thinks it's a bird. And then because the lily pads don't move, um, they sometimes get flagged as nests. So it goes bird, bird, bird. And actually it's a lily pad, lily pad, lily pad. And it goes, hey, you've got a nest. Okay. Um, so we've been training the algorithm to try and ignore lily pads. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the results from the new model to, to tell you how well that, that's gone. All right. So now that we have nest detections, we can transition some of our research questions from bird counts to questions focused on nests. And so we can start to uh, things like looking at series of, of images, 
and uh, thinking about the number of nests and their locations and how they change in the colony over the course of the breeding season, uh, we could potentially start to delve into uh, things about the nest, uh, nest counts changing over time, spatial and temporal dynamics in, in basically the, the, the nest dynamics within a colony. And we're not ready to automate nest success yet, um, but that is definitely on our list. And one of the ways we think we can do it is again, returning to the biology of the species involved and seeing if we can extract information that can at least serve as a filter for whether or not a nest was likely to have been successful or not. So for example, here's a nest identified by our detector. Um, on 315, the drone goes over, there's no sign of activity at the site. There might be just the start of something, but there's been no activity before this time. There's nothing clear in it um, at 315. The drone goes over at 322 a week later, and there's a bird sitting on a nest. The next week, a bird sitting on a nest. The next week, there's a nest, which you can just see. I don't know if I can direct you. There we go. And two little round white things, which are eggs, sitting in the nest right here, an adult sitting to the side. And then by 413, there's no sign of anything. And then after every flight after this point is there's no, there's no activity at this site, no sign of a nest, nothing. And so this is the time series that we know that we have information for. And that was if we assume that the nest started the second after the drone flew over on the 15th and that the nest failed right before the drone flew over on the, on the 13th, then that gives us 29 days of activity. So what do we know about the biology of great egrets? Well, biology says they need around 24 days to incubate their eggs and that the young can leave the nest starting at about 21 days. Now they're not flying, um, but they roam around the canopy like teenagers at the mall. Um, and, and so you, you can't rely, they won't reliably be, be found in the nest. And that's a problem for our ground monitoring, not just for the drone monitoring. Um, so this means that we expect to see something in a nest or an adult tending a nest for about 45 days. And so this says this nest should not have been successful because it did not, didn't stay active long enough for it to successfully uh, rear an offspring. Obviously it would be nice to know whether or not that's actually the case. And this is where our ground monitoring comes in really handy. Um, and so what we've been doing over the past year is having the ground crew move in. So they're monitoring specific nests that they're going in week after week after week and staring with their little mirrors into the nest and seeing what's going on. And so at the, when, the, when the nest is no longer active, they move in, they put a brightly colored piece of, of paper on the nest or very close to the nest um, and then fly the drone. And so now we know the location of particular nests that they have been monitoring and what has been happening at that nest location. I can't show you any data from any of this now, but I can tell you that for this nest, what they have in their notes is that they, they actually were pairing their, their visits right with the drone visit. So they visited on the, the 15th, there was nothing there. The 22nd, they show up, there's actually a bird on a nest, they flag the nest. They do these transects over and uh, every week, they do the same transects. So they come along on the 22nd, suddenly there's an active nest there, they flag it, they start monitoring it. The 30th, the, the, the nest is active, it's got two eggs in it. The, the, the sixth, active, two eggs in it. They come back the 13th and the nest is empty. And so they, and then, and then they classify this as a failed nest because after that, that nest decayed, there was no evidence of anything going on. Um, and uh, there you have it. So there is at least some potential here for being able to use this length of activity from the weekly drone flights to be able to at least get a filter for what proportion of the nests are at least lasting long enough to uh, give offspring, to, to produce offspring, and then being able to look at how that changes over the course of a breeding season. So to summarize um, the Everglades work to date, um, over the past two to three years, We've gone from flying drones and wondering what are we gonna do with all this imagery um, to having the computer now be able to uh, find and identify birds for us, to use those bird locations, to identify nest locations, 
And this already lets us do things like uh, look at the number of birds or nests over the course of a breeding season and sets us up to move into areas of uh, doing colony scale assessments of nest success throughout the breeding season and start to look at things within colonies and between colonies uh, on, on how well uh, these birds are doing. All right, and with that, I will let Ethan wrap it up for you. <laughs> uh, and so just very briefly, uh, one of the things that we're interested in, because we've been so successful at doing this in the Everglades, is how do we facilitate this more broadly? Because you don't want to have to put together a giant team to do this for every single airborne survey. And fortunately, these kinds of methods that we've been developing are known to be good at what's called transfer learning. So they're functionally good at working in new systems with relatively limited amounts of additional data because they learn things like feathers and heads that generally transfer to other systems. And so we've looked at this by pulling together data from a dozen other studies and training the models on everything except one study at a time and looking to see how well can that model actually work with no information, no training data about the particular birds and background that have been looked at. And here's just a couple of examples. Uh, the model does reasonably well, right? It's uh, finding birds in all of these imagery, but it does weird things like it says that this shadow is a bird, which to be fair, it looks like a bird. It's the same shape as a bird uh, and missing things with sort of uh, difficulties distinguishing that bird from, from the background. The good news is if we give it just a tiny little bit of training data from that local site, it does a lot better. So this is the same predictions, but with a thousand local labels. So remember we've got over 50,000 in the Everglades. There's just a thousand here, uh, and a lot of that goes away, right? It learns that a shadow is not a bird. Uh, and I won't spend much time on this. The general behavior of the model works pretty well. Here's the full range. What we basically see is it does really well if it's seen something that kind of looks like what it's being asked to do now. And if it's not doing well, it's because it's something totally different. Like we suddenly gave it penguins in Antarctica is one of our examples. And it's like, whoa, I don't know what to do with that. The particularly interesting thing is that for a small amount of local training data, if you try to build one of these models locally, it will generally do really badly because a thousand labels is simply not enough for this kind of technology. But if you take those same thousand labels and just fine tune the model that we have that we can download from the web, you'll do a really good job. And so we can actually take all this work that we've done and immediately use it to improve this kind of monitoring in other systems. If you want to do this yourself, there's a software package uh, that'll do it. You can run our bird detector on your own imagery in four lines of Python. Uh, take about 20 if you want to fine tune it. And I'll spare us all the next steps since we're at 350 uh, and just bring us back uh, to our gnomes from the beginning of the talk. Oh. And I think the key lesson uh, that we've learned uh, from all of this is that it is possible to cross this question mark bridge, right? It's possible to fill in the gap by working actively to integrate ecology with technology. But this has required a big interdisciplinary team for us. And as those of you who have worked in those teams know, those teams are a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort to overcome the differences in languages and background and interest in order to actually get these things to work. Uh, and so it's feasible, but it's work. And so that means that the future of using technology to collect ecological data at scale is going to depend on us collectively figuring out ways to make these kinds of techniques easier to adapt and apply to novel systems so that we don't have to do this huge amount of effort every time we want to conduct an airborne survey project. And with that, either of us would be happy to take any questions. <laughs>